Amanda, do you want to introduce your two boys? This is Jason and Tom. Hi, Tom, and hi, Jason. We've been studying the book of Joshua, but this morning we're going to take a break from Joshua, and we're going to go to Psalm 103. We just sang the words, O oh Lord, you're beautiful, and your face is all I seek. And I don't know about you, but I had a hard week this week. And one of the places I love to go is Psalm 103, because it reminds me of who God is. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go to Psalm 103. If you're using a pew Bible, a pew Bible is found on page 632. And I'm going to begin, we'll talk about some other verses, but I'm just going to read verses 11 through 18. Hear then the word of God. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with children's children and with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. You can keep your finger on um, Psalm 103 because we'll go back to it. It's on page 632 on your pew Bible. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks that you are not an unknown God but we can know you. You revealed yourself to us in the person of Jesus, but you've also revealed us to you in your word. And so as we consider your word, speak to our hearts. Help us to know you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever wondered what God thinks about you? Our greatest barrier to knowing God better may be how much we know about how much God knows about us. We struggle sometimes with knowing God because we often feel bad about who we are. Sometimes we struggle in praying to God Sometimes it's hard to read our Bible because when we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror, we see who we are. And sometimes when we look in the mirror, we say to ourselves, thinking about God, oh God, I am such a big disappointment. You have created me to be in your image. And look at who I am. I am not who I want to be. And we say, say to ourselves, you ought to be a lot better than you are. Why are you so terrible? We've all felt that way from time to time. Sam Storm, an author, captures the truth in one simple sentence. He says, quote, I think we run from God rather than run to God because we know our own hearts too well. And we don't know the heart of God towards us. We run from God because we know our hearts too well. But we don't know the heart of God towards us. I probably don't 
need to spend a lot of time this morning convincing most of you that we're sinners. God has made us in his image. He made us to be holy. And we've sinned against God. We know the truth about ourselves all too well. But it's the other side that we need to talk about this morning. We don't know God's heart very well. And that's where Psalm 103 has been helpful to me this week. Perhaps no other chapter in the Bible so clearly reveals God's compassion for his people. If you're wondering, what does God think about me? Then you need to take a journey through Psalm 103. The psalm contains seven liberating truths about God's heart towards you. Number one, God loves to help needy people. Take a look at verse six. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Now when the Hebrew Bible uses the word oppressed, oppressed in the Hebrew language refers to those who can't help themselves. And in the Old Testament, it especially referred to widows, orphans, foreigners, people from a different land, and the poor. And the Bible teaches us that God, in a very special way, keeps his eye on the helpless. And when others move to hurt them, God moves his scale of justice to come to their aid, if not in this life, in the next. And so one of the questions we have to ask ourselves as we come to the Lord is, are you needy? This morning as you sit here and you think about your own life, the question is, are you needy? The answer is yes, whether you realize it or not. You are needy. I am needy. God's word tells you this morning, God is on your side. You're not alone. God loves to help those in need. That is the heart of God towards you. Secondly, he shows mercy to those who don't deserve it. In verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and he's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. Take a look at those four attributes. The Lord is compassionate. Even though we sin against God, he pardons us. He's gracious. He gives to us what we don't deserve. The Lord is slow to anger. He's patient with us when we fall. And the Lord abounds in love. He loves us more than we can imagine. Now, if you're re reading, most of you are reading the international version, translation. But the King James version of that last verse says, the Lord is plenteous in mercy. And the word plenteous is, is an old, old English term. And when Charles Spurgeon was writing on this, he talks about the word plenteous. And he wants to describe the mercies of God as we find them throughout scripture. And so he says, the world tastes the sparing mercy of God. Those who hear the gospel partake in his inviting mercy. And saints live by his saving mercy. And we're preserved by his upholding mercy. And we're cheered by his consoling mercy. And we enter in heaven because of his everlasting mercy. Six kinds of mercy. And so we understand the term when it's used in one translation his plenteous mercy. God has mercy towards you. That is the heart of God towards you. He shows you mercy even when you don't deserve it, even when I don't deserve it. Thirdly, he tempers his wrath, verse 9. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us 
as our sin deserves or repay us according to our iniquity. You ever, have you ever known someone who likes to argue? I guess you do. <laughs> who likes to argue for the sake of arguing and even stay angry. God has every right to be angry at us because we've sinned against him. But God does not remain angry. He's willing to end the quarrel. He's willing to welcome us back home even though we have wandered from him. And he loves you so much that he sent his own son, the eternal son of God, to die on the cross for your sins. He is more ready to forgive us than we are ready to forgive ourselves. When we forget to pray, he remembers to feed us. When we forget to give thanks, he still sends us sleepful rest. And when we idle in sin, he sends his Holy Spirit to convict us. And when we refuse to give and be generous, he continues to give to us and be generous to us. And when we fall, even though it's our own fault, he lifts us up. And when we disappoint ourselves and others, he still calls us his children. That is the heart of God towards you. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay. Fourthly, he forgives all of our sins. Verse 11 and 12, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Astronomers tell us that the closest star to us is about 4.2 light years away. Now, most of you understand that light travels at 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. And if you were to use the space shuttle, it would take you 81,000 years to get to the closest star. Statistics like that remind us that we live in a tiny, 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 tiny corner of the universe. And secondly, that the universe is beyond our comprehension. But the Bible teaches us that God's love is greater. It's larger. It's deeper. It's broader. It's bigger than all the dimensions of the universe. And here's the good news. When God forgives, he removes our sin, he lifts it up, he takes it away, and he puts it so far away from us, you could never find your sin in a thousand years. It's gone forever. We sometimes sing that old hymn, my sin, not in part, but in whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I own it no more. God removes your sin so that you may remember it no more because of what Jesus did on the cross. Your sin cannot come back to haunt you. That is the heart of God towards you. He loves you so much he removes your sin. Fifthly, he understands our weakness. Verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I never quite understood this verse until I had children. When our children were very young and they were having a hard time going to sleep, and Dottie had had a full day and she was tired herself, I would pick up one of the young children, maybe 
Anne or David, and I would rock them, and I would sing to them. That's not a good idea. <laughs> and not only would I sing to them, Pam, I would write songs about them. <laughs> and I would, I would make up songs as I sang. And to this day, my children tease me about the songs I sang to them and the lyrics that I put to my songs. But I would sing to them over and over again until they fell asleep. Earthly fathers, however imperfect we are, help us to understand something of the love of God towards us. We as earthly fathers, as earthly grandfathers, are imperfect. But our job is to love our children in such a way that they see something of the love of God towards us. I remember when our youngest boy, David, was three years old. David is the one who um, had bleeding on his brain a number of weeks ago and was in Boston, Leahy Clinic, and he's doing better. But David, when he was three years old, often would get asthma attacks. And I remember the first time taking him to the hospital. David, as a three-year-old, was scared. And the doctor examined him, and the doctor said to me, he needs to stay in the hospital. And David looked at me kind of puzzled as to what that meant. And so I had to explain to David that he would have to be in the hospital by himself. I could stay for a little while, but he would need to spend the night in the hospital. And David began to cry. You know what the doctor did? The doctor picked up David in his arms and put him on his shoulder and carried him to the pediatric ward, skipping as he went, making David laugh. That is what our Heavenly Father does for us. We are frail and we are weak. And when we are frail and weak, God, our Heavenly Father, picks us up and puts us on his back, and he carries us. That is God's heart towards you. Number six, he remembers that we are dust. Verse 14, for he knows how we are formed and he remembers that we are dust. Here's a truth that we all understand, especially in this season of the year, particularly as we've lost Vern, we've lost Chum, Judy has lost her brother. Yesterday's or today's green leaves are going to turn brown. It's a law of nature. The green leaves of summer end up in a pile on our lawn. This fall, in a few short weeks, the leaves will begin to lose their color. And the leaves will turn into unimaginable colors, orange and pink bright reds, russet, maroons, bronze, a hundred shades of brown. And why do the leaves lose their color? I will let Sue and Dottie explain that to you, but it has something to do with the loss of chlorophyll. But simply put, it means that they've begun to die. Here's the irony. Their beauty comes from their death. Probably 30 years ago, Dottie began to say to me, there's a little gray hair in your beard. (laughs) 
In more recent years, she has stopped saying that. <laughs> Not only because there's a lot of gray, but because there's little hair. <laughs> when God puts gray in your hair, it's like leaves turning brown in the fall. It's God's way of reminding us, you won't be here forever. Everyone sitting in this room is going to die. And God reminds us of our frailty. He reminds us of our frailty as our hair turns gray. He reminds us of our frailty as we get sick. He reminds us of our frailty as loved ones die and pass away. He reminds us of our frailty when we have heart attacks. He reminds us of our frailty when we get cancer. If you don't have anything else to be thankful for, here's something you can be thankful for. God is aware of your frailty. He made you. And he gives us hope because we are frail. He does not abandon us. He is our refuge and our strength in the time of trouble. He shelters us under his wings to protect us. In our frailty, God knows it. We are his children. He's aware that you're frail. And he comes to your rescue. He shelters you. He protects you. He watches over you. He feeds you. He gives you rest. He comforts you. He encourages you. That is our hope. And that is God's heart towards you. Lastly, number seven, he links us with eternity by linking us to himself in verse 17 and 18. There's nothing you can do about your frailty. We come from our creator stamped with frail, handle with care. It's interesting how short life is. For those of you who are young, you think life is so slow and takes forever. Trust me, if you talk to anyone in this room who's 60, 70, 80, 90, they will all tell you. It seems like yesterday they were 16. Life goes by so quickly. We try to change that. We take vitamins. <laughs> we exercise. But for all of us, the end is going to be the same. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Psalm 103 offers us one strong ground of comfort that lifts us up. It's the but at the beginning of verse 17. The word but is one of those beautiful words in the Hebrew and the Greek language. When you go to Ephesians 2, you read, you are dead in your sins and your trespasses, but God, being rich in his love and mercy. And so now we learn we're frail, but God. We have the contrast here of the fading flower, the everlasting God. Our mortality, God's eternity. Here's the real hope. Life never ends. I did not say this to Kay yesterday at Chum's funeral, but Kay knows this because she's heard me say it before. We Christians have a wrong view of death. We think we're going from the land of the living to the land of the dead. That's wrong. It's just the opposite. We're going from the land of the dead to the land of the living. We all will die. But for those who trust in Jesus, you will live forever in the presence of God. That is our hope. And that is God's heart towards you. So what is Psalm 103 telling us? It's telling us that we're richer than we think. We're more blessed than we know. We have more than we realize. We who are frail, 
We who are sinners are rich in the mercy and the grace and the love of God towards us. Billy Graham, when he was alive and still preaching, told the story of a patrolman one night in northern England. And the patrolman, while he was patrolling the streets in northern England, heard this whimpering cry of a young boy. And he took his flashlight out and he soon found this young boy quivering in the doorway of a building. And so he went up to the boy and he began to speak to the boy. And the boy said to him, I'm lost, please take me home. And the patrolman wanted to help the boy, but the boy couldn't tell him where he lived. So the patrolman began to name all the streets in the neighborhood, and he went down through the streets. Do you live on this street? And the boy said, no. Do you live on this street? The boy said, no. And then the patrolman remembered that there was a large church in the middle of town with a steeple on it, with a cross on top. And so the patrolman picked up the boy and said, do you live near the church with the cross on top? He goes, yes, yes. Take me to the cross and I can find my way home, he said. For all of us, that's true. We're lost. You may think you're not lost. We're lost. But if we look to the cross, if we look to God, if we look to Jesus, we will find our way home. Go to the cross, go to Jesus, place your trust in him, and you will find your way home. Are you weak? So am I. Are you needy? So am I. Are you guilty of sin? So am I. Are you frail? I am. Are you like the dust? So am I. And so God says to us, those of us who are weak, those of us who are guilty of sin, those of us who are frail, he says, I know you through and through. I made you. And I know you are frail. I know you are weak. I know you are guilty. And I love you anyway. Rest in me. Place your trust in me. Make me the rock of your salvation. That is God's heart towards you. If you're here this morning and you don't know God, I would pray that you would say the words the little boy said, take me to the cross. It's only in knowing Jesus that we find comfort and encouragement in this life. God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son that we might know him. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you, and I confess in my own life, I am weak, I am needy, I am guilty, and I am frail. But I know you are the creator God. You are the Lord Almighty, and you have made us, and you are the rock, and the fortress. So help us to trust in you, for you love us. For those who don't know you, help them to confess their own need and to invite you to be their Lord and Savior. We give you thanks for your great love to us this morning, Father. Remind us, for we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we sing?